I'm going to introduce a very, very good friend of mine. Uh, he's been in the public service for many, many years. And that is uh, Honorable Gray Davis, uh, former governor of the state of California. In fact, Governor Davis has been a really good friend of Committee 100 for the last several years. He always participated in our Committee 100's events. And specifically, two years ago when uh, President Xi Jinping came to Los Angeles, uh, we, he and I worked together, in fact, you know, helped Governor Jerry Brown setting up the uh, meetings with all the party secretaries that came along with President Xi. In addition to that, whenever there are delegations from, from China who, come, uh, who came out to visit, every now and then when I need to have a senior government official to help me out, you know, to make sure C100 look more present, presentable, I always can count on him to be right by my side to do the greeting. And he had helped us to set tremendous goodwill for all these years, not only for Committee 100, but more importantly, in terms of meeting with all these overseas guests. So without further ado, I would like to have uh, Governor Davis to please come up. Thank you, Dominic, and uh, Ni Hao, and thank you to uh, the Committee of 100. I'm so proud of, of what you have done over the last 25 years to strengthen relationships between the United States and China and to encourage uh, Chinese Americans to take a more active role uh, in the public policy affairs of, uh, of America. Uh, I'm um, very pleased to be able to introduce uh, one of our featured speakers today, I worked with Jerry Brown in the 70s and early 80s when he was governor the first two times. Uh, but I'm very proud of, of his third term. In America, we have this phrase, we say the third term is a charm, and that, is, <laughs> that is, seems to be the case. Uh, the governor was elected in, for the third time in 2010, only the second governor ever to do that, and he is already the longest serving governor, and who knows, he may get elected again. Um, but when he got elected, he inherited a $26 billion deficit from some of his predecessors. I was part of that, not most of it, but part of it. Uh, and yet four years later, we have no deficit. Uh, the books are balanced. We've had three on-time budgets. I spoke to uh, Governor, I spoke to the Bond Buyer Conference and it just blew them away that we actually are getting on-time budgets. Uh, but that's a testimony to his uh, hard work and the legislative leaders. And he's also uh, focused on uh, uh, job creation. We led the nation in 2013 in private sector job creations, over 300,000. Uh, so some very good things are happening. Now, how, how did that happen? After everyone making fun of California for years and years and years, how did we all of a sudden become kind of the turnaround story for America? Well, uh, the governor and the legislature made some very tough cuts. He then persuaded the voters to pass Prop 30 to tax themselves now, albeit those of us in the room a little more, uh, but the bottom line is people understood we had to have great schools, we had to have great universities, there was a cost associated with that, and they were willing to pay that price. So a combination of those um, two changes got the state back on the right track, the financial analysts have upgraded us twice, and now the governor's pursuing a uh, rainy day fund. Uh, David Dreyer and other people who have been in government know, we, and John Chang, the uh, controller, knows we go through these cycles. We have great years when all kinds of money comes in, and then bad years when no money comes in. And to level that thing out, uh, he's proposing the adoption of a rainy day fund, which will take capital gains-driven uh, uh, revenues, Professor, and put them in a separate account only for capital purposes, possibly for pension uh, purposes, but to basically pay down the wall of debt uh, that he inherited. In addition to writing the financial ship, as you know, the governor took a trip to China last year uh, promoting uh, all kinds of California exports from uh, Napa wine to agricultural exports to our uh, agricultural technology. 
And there's been a lot of follow-up on that, and I think you're going to see uh, China and the United States working very closely on uh, pollution controls and mechanisms to reduce pollution in China. Uh, back here, he has always been ahead of his time. I was pr privileged to work with him the first two years. Uh, he had a 55% uh, solar tax credit, was worried about carbon reduction way back then. He's still fighting climate change, determined to have America's first high-speed rail, um, going to fix California's broken water system, which, by the way, provides water to uh, America's largest agricultural economy in California, and about two-thirds of the people who live in part of the state where it doesn't rain very much. And he's also focused on um, helping low-performing schools. At the college level, he wants to reduce uh, uh, the, the debt that uh, may, some say, uh, discourage people from buying homes that have so much college debt by encouraging greater use of online courses to reduce the amount of tuition and reduce the, uh, the cost of going to college. So he's got a very aggressive agenda. Uh, let me close with this one thought. I've been in associated with government for over 31 years, uh, starting with Governor Brown way back in 1975. By the way, uh, some people wonder why that seven and a half minute speech uh, that he gave for his inaugural address was so short. Well, I don't think he'll be too offended if I share this because the statute of limitations has run. He started writing it at 10.30 at night. So by two o'clock, we had seven minutes done, we all went to bed, it was a seven minute speech. But it was very well received and uh, kind of was a sign of the uh, frugal, simple, uh, back-to-basics approach that he has taken to California, which has got us on the right track. In any event, everyone said from the moment I walked into uh, his office in 1975, is California governable? And I think after the last four years uh, under Governor Brown's leadership, the answer is a resounding yes. So please give the governor of California, Jerry Brown, a warm welcome. He didn't tell the story about the holes in the rug, though. When I came into office, I followed an actor that you know about him, Ronald Reagan. <laughs> Actually, I followed an actor most recently, Arnold Schwarzenegger. <laughs> so it's my mission to always come into office after an actor has been there. <laughs> so I'm not as exciting, but I try to get things done. Anyway, when I came in the first time, uh, it had been eight years. I noticed Nancy Reagan had purchased a new rug when my father was there. My father was the governor before Ronald Reagan. He left in 1966. And she put in a new rug, and so I figured I'd be very frugal, I'd just leave it there. And so this nice, it was a very rich looking kind of burgundy ru uh, rug in my inner office. So as the years went on, I was governor for eight years, it became frayed and there were tears, but I just put masking tape over it. Because <laughs> I wanted the legislators when they came in to know that, that spending was not going to be easy in my administration. So then I came in uh, again, and I think it was Gray Davis who had put a little kitchen in the governor's inner office. And I guess we had a little kitchen there and Schwarzenegger kept it. So I said, we gotta take that thing out. I like, uh, I want more, more room. I like to get up and walk around. So when we took out the kitchen, <clears throat> there was a big hole because there was a pipe for the sink. So then I said, well, what's a new rug gonna cost? And they told me 27,000. I said, that's too much. So I borrowed a friend's um, Persian rug and I just poured it and put it over the hole. <laughs> it's still there. If you come into my office, you'll see a nice, Persian rug, where Gray Davis had built that uh, little office, not an office, a, a little kitchen. So, and some people may say that's a little, it's a little thing, it is a little thing, um, but uh, you, you have to do a lot of little things uh, to keep things uh, in charge and keep things uh, <clears throat> uh, in line. Now, they were just writing three years ago. They, media pundits, all sorts of people were saying California, uh, is like a failed state because the deficits were so huge. Uh, and they did get pretty big, 27 billion. And that was on a revenue stream of about 83, 85 billion. 
Well, today we have, uh, uh, we have a surplus for a lot of different reasons. And uh, the question is, is it governable? Well, it's governable, uh, but you got to take, you have to have a strong stomach and you have to be able to say no as often as saying yes. And for whatever reason, um, I don't find saying yes that easy. In fact, it took me 15 years to propose to my wife. <laughs> so I am definitely a conservative in a very fundamental sense. She is now my special counsel and uh, working for the state and doing a, working for the state for free, of course, and doing a hell of a job. She's also frugal, very frugal. So you've got two people who are very careful about the money. But frugality is not enough. You have to invest. That's why uh, California is building the only high-speed rail system in the country. And people say, well, how can you find $65 billion? Well, if you know that the gr gross domestic product in California every year is $2 trillion, and you can do the arithmetic, $65 billion for a system the last 100 years is a very modest investment. So we're charging ahead. And, and we have lawsuits, as often happens, and many may run into that, but we're fighting them back. And we are investing. We're investing in our schools. Uh, the state of California this year will put $10 billion more into the school system, and that's from a, um, a base of $47 billion adding 10. So uh, there are a lot of reasons for that. Economic recovery, the cuts that have been made in other programs, and the tax that was passed. And so that's another thing. People never thought, uh, I said when I ran for governor that I was, they said, are you going to raise taxes? I knew my opponent. I ran against, I didn't run against a movie actor, I ran against a billionaire. And that's a problem. But, by the way, I just got to tell you, since I'm among bankers, you understand money. And uh, investors and, and uh, business people. Um, my opponent spent $100 million in her campaign running for governor against me before I had spent even $1 million. But because I saved my money, I outspent her the last two weeks on television. Because I had saved. And so I don't, I believe in spending money, but I believe in spending it wisely. And don't buy anything that isn't going to get you what you're trying to achieve. So anyway, uh, that's that. Uh, there's a lot of things I could talk about, but most importantly, I'm going to talk about the Chinese-California um, uh, relationship. We had the privilege to receive the president of China not once, but twice in California. And my wife had the privilege of taking uh, uh, his wife through museums in Palm Springs, and we had a chance to have a, a personal meeting uh, with the president, and we talked about California and China. Now, you might wonder, how can this little state of California have its own policy with the big nation of China? Well, we do. That's just the way it is. California is a nation state. <laughs> now, it is. Uh, we're, we're, we're not leaving the union, however. We're too connected. We're very connected. But because so little is going on in Washington, it opens up space and opportunity to do things in California. And that's why on my last trip to China, uh, we actually signed between the state of California a memorandum of understanding with the Development and Reform Commission of, of the People's Republic of China. And I believe it's the first state that has signed a formal agreement uh, with a uh, entity of the national government in China. And we're going to do more. We have actually native-born Chinese working in our Air Resources Board, and they uh, are working on joint efforts uh, to curb pollution in various provinces, in Guangdong and Shanghai and other places. So we are committed to build a very uh, deep and pervasive relationship with China. And we're doing that based on tourism, based on exports, uh, based on agriculture, uh, based on investments in movies, uh, in high technology, in biocom, uh, 
the internet investments, uh, renewable energy, uh, and all sorts of things. So we have a lot of connections, and we want to uh, make it. And there are, I'm not saying business in California is easy. We have a lot of regulations. We have a lot of lawsuits. Uh, we have a lot of taxes. But as I was talking to, I was talking to a fellow I met at a, uh, one evening, and uh, he was of uh, Indian descent, and he told me, he said he had started uh, three businesses in, in California. I said, why are you in California? Don't the taxes and the regulations bother you? He said, no. He said, I find that here in Silicon Valley, there's the smartest people who are making things, and there's the smartest investors who give these smart people money. So I haven't found anywhere else in the world where there's as many smart people with money able to invest in these other smart people who are doing all these things. So with that, he's able to overcome whatever the uh, limitations are. And some people say it's expensive to live here. Well, this is the way I compare California and Texas. Anybody here from Texas, by the way? <laughs> Look, you know, you didn't, you didn't have this banquet at Motel 6, right? <laughs> You want to go to the Four Seasons, you want to go to the Ritz-Carlton, you pay a little more than if you go to the Motel 6. Well, you want to live in California, you got to pay a little more. But it's high quality, prestige pricing. You get what you pay for. And you get a lot if you're in California. And to the extent we have any problems, we're going to solve them. Just let me know what they are. Before I go, just give me your card. If you have a particular problem, let me know. Uh, we're, but we are, uh, I feel a, a real connection to, uh, to not only the Chinese community, but uh, China itself. The people uh, left China to come uh, to this city, to Gold Mountain, uh, around the time of the gold rush. At the same time, my forebears, my great-grandparents were leaving Ireland and were leaving Germany, and they came here. And I feel that connection particularly because uh, my great-grandfather, who worked the land, came here, didn't know any English, um, but he worked, bought some land, and uh, farmed. He lived a good life, died in 1907 at the age of 80, and he had a youngest daughter, was my grandmother. Um, she lived till 1974 at the age of 96, and luckily, he got this big, beautiful ranch, and it's still in the family, because what I learned from my forebears, never sell land, just accumulate more. And that's very true in California, because real estate is not getting, they're not making any more California real estate. So if you want to, may go down for a couple of years, but long term, uh, this is the gateway to the Pacific. And so we've established an office in Shanghai. Uh, we have uh, brought a very large delegation over uh, just last year. We'll have more of that. And I am looking to forge agreements, not just with China, but with Mexico, uh, with Canada, with Germany, and other places uh, on a wide range of subjects. And one particular uh, energy, renewable energy and climate change is one that's uh, very, uh, very important to everyone. And it won't work unless we're all in it together. <clears throat> and that's why it's <clears throat> a great thing that California can work on the pollution problems of China. And we have the example, Los Angeles has 10 times more cars than 40 years ago and has 90% less pollution. Well, that's a matter of regulation, investment, and technology, and a willingness of, of people to do what we need to do. So we have that kind of expertise, and we want to work uh, with our uh, partners in China, and we want them uh, to work with us. So we're looking for investment uh, here, and we're looking for collaboration uh, across uh, many, many sectors. So it's very exciting uh, to be part of that. And I mentioned my forebears because I think it's important to understand where we come from, to understand your roots. We're in an age of big change, of unpredictable uh, occurrences in the world. So we need to be grounded in our traditions as we reach out and embrace uh, new people, different ideas, different technologies. So this is really a state a state of imagination, uh, not just a state of the union. 
And so I'm glad you're here. Uh, and I hope whatever thoughts and ideas you get, uh, that they'll turn into uh, practical things going down the road. Uh, I just want to say it's very important in the uh, investment uh, of Chinese people in America, of course, in the world, but in California particularly. The population of uh, California, of all people of Asian uh, extraction, is 13 um, <clears> percent. <throat> the, uh, actually, the Latino population is now close to 40. So we old Caucasians are a are kind of a disappearing species here. Um, in fact, I may be the last one of this group that is the governor of California, so I may have to hang on as long as I can uh, <laughs> just to keep it going. Um, and I'll just conclude by saying I'm the only governor that even has a chance for a fourth term. Um, they, they have a rule in California, you can only be a governor at two terms. But it doesn't apply to me. <laughs> it doesn't. Uh, by the way, another point, you know, I'm a Democrat. I imagine you got a few Republicans here. In California, there have only been four Democratic governors since 1895. Four. Two are named Brown. One is named Davis. <laughs> so that's it. Anyway, have a wonderful meeting. It's uh, great to be part of it. It is my deepest honor to be introducing to you our keynote speaker today. Uh, professor Joseph E. Stieglitz uh, is university professor at Columbia University, where I come from New York as well, so we're fellow New Yorkers. Welcome. Uh, he is the winner of the 2001 Nobel Memorial Prize in Economics and a lead author of the 1995 PP IPP IPCC report which shared the 2007 Nobel Peace Prize. He was chairman of the U.S. Council of Economic Advisors under President Clinton and chief economist and senior vice president of the World Bank during 1997 to 2000. Dr. Stieglitz received the John Bates Clark Medal awarded annually to American econ economists under 40. Of course, he's a little older than that today and continued to win many awards who has made the most significant contribution to this subject. He was a Fulbright Scholar at Cambridge University, held the Drummond Professorship in All Souls College at Oxford, and has also taught at MIT, Yale, Stanford, and Princeton. He is the author, most recently, of the, uh, the, sorry, the Price of Inequality, How Today's Divided Society Endangers Our Future. In 2011, Time magazine named him one of the world's 100 most influential people. The subject of inequality is on top of many of our minds today, so we'd like to welcome Dr. Stieglitz. Thank you. Well, it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, I've been asked to talk a little bit about China's reform uh, policies and uh, some of America's, uh, how America can help promote those. My, my involvement with uh, uh, China's economic policy began actually uh, many years ago in 1980 when uh, China was just beginning the transition to a market economy. They sent over a delegation from the Chinese Academy of Social Science, Science that met with a small group of us from uh, America's uh, uh, National Academy of Sciences. And uh, we, we spent uh, a week together talking about uh, the strategies of transition. I'd like to think that uh, some of the advice that we gave then helped them, uh, help China make a much more successful transition than the advice given by some of my colleagues uh, to Russia. Uh, when it began its transition <laughs> in, in, in 1989. I won't go through the details of how, what we said and what they said and, and why um, China has done so much better. Uh, 
But one of the features of, of China's success is uh, one of the most impressive part uh, of it uh, of its uh, economic evolution is its constant change in its economic strategy, both as it developed itself and as the world uh, changed. Uh, it became clear, uh, increasingly clear uh, over the last 10 years that the strategy that had led to uh, that China's enormous success over the preceding 25 years uh, its policy of export-led growth uh, would inevitably come to an end. It had saturated markets everywhere. You could only buy so many flat screen televisions. Uh, you have four walls uh, in every room. And uh, they would have to change their strategy. In their 11th and 12th uh, five-year plans, they, they announced that they were going to change the strategy, but Things happened very slowly, I think disappointingly slowly, even for the, uh, the government. Uh, so for instance, one of the things that they had said is that uh, they wanted to bring down the national savings rate. The United States uh, has been struggling to increase our savings rate. You know, our, our personal savings rate uh, reached uh, negative levels uh, during the first years of this century. Uh, we've now gotten it up almost to 4.5%. Uh, but China has been struggling to get it down. Uh, it was close to 50%. And after announcing that they were going to lower it, it wound up a little bit above 50%. Uh, so uh, there's been a little bit of, of, of adjustment of numbers as they discovered GDP that they hadn't counted. Uh, and the GDP was a little bit larger. Uh, than they thought, but the necessity of moving away from export-led growth uh, uh, has long been recognized. But the 2008 crisis brought uh, this uh, issue to, to, to uh, 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 the fore, uh, the form, uh, to, to a head. Um, it became clear that with the export markets in the United States and Europe plummeting, uh, they had to change their economic strategy. They had no choice. And um, if you look at the data that uh, followed the uh, collapse of Lehman Brothers in uh, September 2008, the, the, the decline in trade was actually greater than in the Great Depression. And China responded in a way that was uh, impressive. I, I, I'd like to think that they uh, perhaps had read our textbooks. Uh, they were much better students of Western economics than those in Washington, and certainly much better than those in Brussels. Uh, because they understood that when the economy was going down, uh, you need to stimulate the economy. Uh, and they introduced what we would call Keynesian stimulus measures. Uh, things that the governor was talking about, like high-speed railroads, were accelerated and have actually brought the country together in ways that, that the West Coast and the East Coast were brought together uh, in the United States in the uh, uh, latter half of the 19th century. China is doing very rapidly uh, in this decade. And, and, and the, they, they saw the crisis as an opportunity uh, to, uh, to move ahead rapidly. So the result of these forces and, and the decisions in the, in the third plenum that were held uh, this fall has really uh, led to a move away from export-led growth. And the question is, to what? And what I want to emphasize is that the move uh, it's increasingly being recognized is to domestically led growth. But that doesn't mean consumption led growth, at least the material kind of consumption led growth that has marked the United States. The United States, 70% of all GDP is related to, to, to consumption. If China followed America's model, the, the world, our planet, will not survive. And we, we need to recognize that, that, 
that the level of pollution, the level of, of uh, carbon emissions would be such that uh, the, the concerns of global warming occurring sometime distant in the future would be an, a current reality. Uh, we are already seeing some of the effects of, of global warming. Uh, if China followed America's course, uh, that would be an inevitability and much sooner than we uh, would want. So what does that mean? What that means is that uh, China's growth uh, can't be based on this kind of material consumption. Hopefully America will get the lesson and change its course. So the strategy that is, I think, evolving in, in China uh, is based on a recognition that it has to change, but the change has to be to uh, a broader domestically led growth that is based on uh, two areas. One is investments, investments in urbanization. Uh, this year marks the first year in the world in which the fraction of the world's population living in cities is greater than 50%. And uh, within, within a quarter century, it will be uh, more than 75%. Uh, and much of that urbanization will be occurring in China. The pace of urbanization is very rapid. It's about 1% each point uh, a year. And uh, it will be absolutely essential for them to make investments in the cities to make the cities you might say livable, parks, public transportation. Uh, the second area where they'll have to be making investments is in the environment. Uh, any of you who have visited Shanghai or Beijing uh, know uh, what I'm talking about. Uh, when I checked into uh, the hotel in uh, uh, Beijing in March, um, I was at a, a meeting uh, with the Chinese Academy of Social Science, and then we had a meeting in the China Development Forum with the government. Uh, they issued face masks uh, because the pollution was so bad, and we were warned not to go outside. Uh, so uh, that's obviously an important, you know, you talk about the quality of life, the government was talking about the quality of life. If you can't breathe the air, uh, that is a, a very big negative in the quality of life. It's going to take a lot of investment in order to change the, uh, the, the economy away from uh, these activities that are very adverse to the environment to a, uh, a, a, you might say, a green economy. So those are two of the areas that will be uh, very paramount in its strategy. Uh, the other thing is moving to a more service sector economy. Uh, China's economy has been very much oriented around manufacturing. That was really where the success has been. But advanced economies increasingly today are service sector economies. The United States is, uh, uh, manufacturing is now about 9% of GDP. You wouldn't know it from the while we talk about manufacturing, and uh, it's been at that level less than 12% for a very long time. A lot of discussion about manufacturing coming back. It's not going to happen. It may happen a little bit, but the likelihood is that manufacturing will remain in the United States under 10 percent. Uh, China will be moving more to the service sector economy, and that's partly because the things that people care about are, and the areas that, that there has been weakness have been in the service sector. What people care about right now are things like education, health, some of the things the government mentioned about tourism, those are all things that people really uh, want to consume more of. The good news is those areas are not as bad for the environment as the materialistic goods-oriented patterns of consumption that have marked uh, uh, the United States. So uh, uh, these are going to be other areas where there will be uh, significant increases in domestically-led demand. One of the, one of the uh, ideas that came out very strongly from the third plenum report that I mentioned earlier was the, the uh, uh, decision that 
uh, market should play a decisive role in, the, uh, in resource allocation. It's a continuation of China's move to a market economy uh, with Chinese characteristics. One has to understand, though, what that phrase means and what, what, they, what I think they have in mind, and this is based on a discussion with a large number of senior government officials. Uh, what they're really focusing on is addressing the problems in the state-owned enterprises, uh, moving more of the state-owned enterprises out of the state and into the private sector. Many of those activities, there are no good rationale for them to be in the state. And, and there's a really thoughtfulness going on of the question of what activities should be conducted by the government and what activities should be conducted by the private sector. It's a really very thoughtful discussion. But as what they think about that issue, they'll have to think more broadly about the set of problems facing China society today. And in many of these areas, and many of the major areas facing uh, society, uh, it's not the market that will provide the answer. It will require uh, an active role for the state, for the government. Let me just mention some of the key issues that are, are uh, uh, at the core of, of China's continuing uh, development, continuing movement to a market economy. Three of them I've already referred to earlier, urbanization, health, and education. Uh, two of the other areas, uh, one of which I've already mentioned, is the environment. Uh, and finally, one of the problems that they've been concerned with now for more than a, uh, a decade is growing inequality. China has almost succeeded in getting as much inequality as the United States. Not quite but they are aspiring to the same level. And as you know, uh, the United States has the highest level of inequality of any of the advanced countries. Uh, the United States has also uh, achieved the distinction of having, uh, if not the worst, among the worst, equality of opportunity. Uh, we think of ourselves as a land of opportunity, and we have provided, over the years, uh, an opportunity for many people to, do, to move up. But when a social scientist or an economist refers to opportunity, what we're referring to are the statistics. What are the life chances? What are the probabilities? And in those terms, uh, the, like, the, the life prospects of a young American are more dependent on the income and education of his parents than in any of the other advanced countries for which there's data. And that includes old, rigid Europe. So while they've changed their economies to provide more opportunity, uh, things are actually uh, not going well uh, in the United States. And unfortunately, in some ways, uh, China has been emulating uh, America's example. Uh, but the good news is, at least in China, it has become a matter of national priority to deal with these problems of growing inequality. Well, the reason I listed those areas, inequality, environment, urbanization, health, and education, those are all areas where, to some extent or another, the government will have to play an important role. You can't create livable cities without some degree of planning. And even though planning has gotten a very bad name, you have to have planning. Uh, if you don't have planning, you have congested roads, you have uh, cities that are, are polluted, you have unplanned cities, and that's actually one of the big problems today uh, in China, and will get worse uh, as urbanization proceeds. Uh, the problems of inequality are, to some extent, a result of unbridled markets. So all the problems that I described before are problems that will not be resolved unless uh, uh, the government will take uh, an active role. So the real debate in China is a debate that has occurred in the United States and was occurring in all countries, which is what are the things the government needs to do and what are the things the market needs to do? 
a realization that the government was doing not too much, but the wrong things. And the real, 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 uh, realization that, that uh, the st strategies will have to be changed. Well, uh, that brings me to, to uh, a final part of my talk, talking a little bit about uh, future US-China economic relations. The change in China's economic strategy is going to mean that the large uh, trade surpluses that have characterized China in the past are likely to get much smaller. Many forecasts they will actually disappear. Uh, the problem of global imbalances will not disappear because the global imbalances occurred not just in Asia, but also in Europe. Uh, the magnitude of the trade surpluses in Germany and Northern Europe already exceed that of China, both in absolute dollars and as a percentage of GDP. And uh, China is now no longer the major source of trade, of trade imbalances. And those are likely to come down, as I said, very rapidly. Unfortunately, though, this won't solve the tension in US trade between China and America. And that's because even though the global imbalances come down, the bilateral trade deficits will remain large. So one way of thinking about what is going on is, as China uh, uh, moves away from its export-led growth, uh, to more domestic consumption uh, and, and domestic-led uh, demand, the areas that I talked about are not going to lead to significant increases in U.S. exports. If it expands its education and health system, it's not going to be exporting that much more to the United States. As it goes about urbanization, that's not going to by itself lead to more exports to the United States. So that new strategy in China will lead to global, a reduction in its global trade uh, surplus, but won't have as much effect on US bilateral trade deficits, which have a lot to do with our own uh, particular economic policies. The result of this is, unfortunately, that tension was uh, in the US recent initiatives for the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Uh, the word, uh, the, the, uh, in, in area of trade, uh, there's lots of euphemisms that are used. So uh, today we call them partnerships because it's obviously better to be a partner. Uh, but they're not partnerships in the usual sense. Uh, they're they're one-sided partnerships. Uh, <laughs> Where, where the, while the, the negotiations, it's, it's, it's a little bit, uh, I won't say it's, uh, it's not a level fit playing field. Uh, and that's true, we often call these free trade agreements. But they're not free trade agreements. Uh, you know, I jokingly say if there was a free trade agreement, they'd be about three pages long. We get rid of our tariffs, you get rid of your tariffs. We get rid of our non-tariff barriers, you get rid of your non-tariff barriers. We get rid of our subsidies, you get rid of uh, your subsidies. Uh, and if you know these agreements, they go on for uh, hundreds of pages. And only the trade lawyers really know what's inside of them. Uh, as uh, anybody in politics know, you, you, you call a bill, whenever you see a, a name of a bill, it usually means the opposite. So if it's called a free trade agreement, you know it's a managed trade agreement. And it's usually managed for, for certain uh, particular interests. Well, uh, the, the Trans-Pacific Partnership agreements, uh, Agreement, uh, which is under discussion right now, has raised a lot of issues and concerns in China. One of them is that China's not a member. And that has led a suspicion on some people's part that the TPP is an attempt to economically isolate China. 
Uh, I'm not going to try to guess what was in the minds of, of the people who uh, 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 decided to go ahead, uh, to, to design the TPP, but I think it probably was in the minds of at least some of them. From an economic point of view, there's a real concern because one of the successes of Asia has been the development of an Asia supply chain where goods move freely around from one country to another. So a lot, you know, you take the iPhone, for instance, uh, a California product in which California has actually very little uh, uh, part of the manufacturing, and uh, most of the products, most of the profits are reported somewhere in cyberspace. Uh, they, they claim that they make most of their profits in Ireland. I never understood that. Uh, and uh, therefore, they own, and they, there's something called the double Irish that many of you may know about, where, where not only are the profits made in Ireland, but they're made in Ireland in such a way they don't even have to pay taxes to the low tax rates in Ireland. So um, this is part of, uh, of, uh, of, of, of globalization. But uh, one of the, while they're assembled in China, some of the key parts are made in Japan. And so you can't think of this as either a Ch Japanese, American, or a, uh, a Chinese product. And having supply chains where you don't have barriers, some countries in the trade agreement, some countries out, uh, that has created what many uh, academics, trade economists, call the spaghetti bowl effect. You can't tell what it is, you can't, you, you're trying to break up a flow of trade in a global system, and it's actually destroying the multilateral system that has been work so hard to create in the last 60 years. Um, at the same time, some in China believe that perhaps they should join TPP negotiations. I don't think they're going to be invited, but they, they say, can we do something to join? They think it would, might, might perhaps like jo joining the WTO serve to, as a vehicle for pushing reforms, some of the reforms in China. So, so there is certainly a lot of, of discussion uh, on those issues. But as currently conceived, uh, TPP is receiving uh, very strong resistance, both domestically in the United States and internationally. And I think de rightly so, I think deservedly so. Uh, the uh, uh, Senator Reid, uh, the Senate, has said he won't submit a fast track bill uh, this year. And the head of the Senate Finance Committee that's in charge of trade uh, has said that unless there is more transparency, uh, he won't support. Uh, one of the things that the USTR, and one of the mistakes they made is uh, uh, the staffer of, of the head of the Senate Finance Committee wanted to find out what our negotiation position was. He went down to the USTR and he said, uh, we only disclose that kind of information to corporate uh, 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 to corporations, not to uh, the Senate. He didn't quite say it that way, but he couldn't get and, uh, that information, and, he was, uh, and the response is, unless we get transparency, unless we know what the United States is negotiating for, we're not going to give any fast track. Uh, there are other problems that have uh, arisen in these trade negotiations um, uh, that have led uh, other countries like Japan, uh, Malaysia, Vietnam, all to express some uh, misgivings. Uh, one of them is uh, in the uh, poorer countries, particularly concerned about access to medicines, access to generic medicines. Uh, others are that there are provisions in these bills that undermine health, environment, um, consumer protections. Uh, uh, the uh, governor was referring to the importance of regulations. They, they are part of the uh, protection that we all value. And yet, there are provisions in these so-called trade agreements that are not about that. They're about uh, 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 these basic protections. Just to give you one example, there is a provision in, uh, in these investment agreements, a similar agreement, in uh, some other trade uh, agreements that we've signed 
Uruguay has passed uh, some regulations to discourage smoking. We all know that smoking causes cancer, has all other adverse effects. Uh, Mayor Bloomberg in New York is taking very strong action to try to restrain it. But under these trade agreements, Philip Morris is suing Uruguay to get rid of some of the regulations that they've made to help protect their citizens. Regulations that the World Health Organization has praised as helping protect uh, their citizens. We're trying to protect, promote these investment agreements in Europe. And Europe is trying to say, we don't understand. We have as strong property rights as you have in America. What are these investment agreements about? They're not about protecting property rights, because we have strong property rights. What these investment agreements are about stripping away regulations and giving corporations the right to sue states and governments directly. So there is much at stake in these agreements, and uh, there is an increasing sentiment that uh, they will not work to the well-being of the citizens in either side of the Pacific. Well, that leads us to the question, what can we do to continue to open up, to, to continue to promote the reform efforts in China? And I think there are, uh, uh, a number of things that I, I'd like to uh, just mention very briefly. Uh, the first is, is obviously, uh, uh, I feel a, a little bit embarrassed, but, but it's part of our self-interest uh, uh, as academics. I think that, open, that, that uh, American universities, the, the fact that so many people from China have had a chance to come and study in American universities has played an enormous role in the reforms uh, in China that we don't fully appreciate, that, uh, that changing mindsets is really at, at the core of success. And the experiences they have living in the United States, the experiences they have in thinking, uh, in debating, are, are at the, uh, will be at the core of uh, successful reform. The second thing is um, uh, to uh, continue to uh, open up our markets for investment from China. Uh, again, the governor referred to uh, efforts to, to get investment from China into the state. But there are uh, many areas where there's been a resistance to efforts for, from, from China to invest in the United States. And there are even continuing restrictions on U.S. exports to China in areas that are called high technology, where we restrict it, but they can buy it from any other country around the world. We don't have uh, a monopoly on technology. So uh, trying to open up our market more, uh, our investment markets and our export markets uh, for China, could be an important strand going forward. And the third area has to do with global governance. China uh, is almost certainly the largest economy in the world today. Uh, the numbers are, uh, don't show it yet. Uh, there's some interesting numbers uh, we call purchasing power parity numbers, where you can compare, take into account the differences in purchasing power. Uh, they're under revision right now. They were supposed to be released in, in the March. Uh, one of the uh, uh, aspects of those numbers under, is that under those new numbers, China already is the largest economy in the world. Uh, China, trying to keep its head below the parapet, uh, says we don't want those numbers to be released yet. Uh, we don't want to be the largest economy in the world. We'd rather be uh, a little bit uh, n not quite the largest, but the, the number, it if it's not this year, it'll be next year. So as the largest economy in the world, uh, China will take, play an increasingly important role in global governance. China is already the largest source of savings in the world. It's the largest trading economy in the world. And given its size, it will have to play a 
larger and larger role in global governance. The problem is that the existing institutional arrangements and the existing holders of, you might say, the powers in the global governance don't want to make the requ requisite adjustments. You take the IMF, the World Bank, uh, there have been some adjustments, but the framework basically is a framework that was determined about the relative size of the economies back in 1944 when those institutions were established. As I say, there have been some adjustments, but to give you one example, mild, very mild reforms in the governance were approved by the G20. But they had to be voted on by the governments of each of the countries. And the United States Congress refuses to adopt even the mild adjustments in global governance that would move us slightly to the direction of the realities that we have today. So I think uh, one of the things that uh, will be uh, very important is to recognize that China uh, will play a more important role, to welcome that role, to encourage it, obviously, as it already is beginning to do, to act it in a responsible way. One of the important initiatives that I've been involved in is the creation of a new uh, uh, international financial institution, the BRICS Bank, bringing together the BRICS countries to help recycle the surpluses that are being created in the BRICS to the developing countries, to Africa, uh, to make sure that, that you know, we live in a world where there is vast needs, surpluses, excess savings, and we ought to bring the excess savings to where the resource, to where our global needs are um, for development, for, for changing, for, for uh, retrofitting the global economy, for global warming. So these are among the things that I think that that uh, we in America should do to help facilitate this new order that is going to be, or is being established uh, today. So uh, looking forward, uh, China's story is the most interesting, most dramatic story uh, in the global economy over the last 35 years. And uh, we should all continue to look at, at this unfolding drama uh, with enthusiasm. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Stiglitz. That was a really interesting and uh, insightful uh, talk. Um, I must say that I'm particularly honored to, to thank uh, Professor Stiglitz because not only am I a, a member of the C100, but also um, uh, an overseer of Columbia Business School from which uh, Professor Stiglitz hails. And it's good to see him holding the Columbia flag up here. <laughs> I, uh, he's too modest to say how really, how. Uh, well respected and regarded he is in China. When I first spoke to uh, Professor Stiglitz some years ago at, at a Columbia dinner like this, um, I asked him for a review of um, China's economy. He had just returned from an extensive trip there. And um, he gave me a, a very deep, uh, thorough rundown, um, often citing the views of some of the very top economic thinkers in China. So I said, well, Professor, how do you have access to all these really important people and he said very modestly, well, uh, most of them are my students. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you so much for sharing your wisdom with us. You have many more students here today. Now for our next treat, um, I'm very honored to be able to introduce you to um, Secretary um, Lin Jinghai, who is the Secretary of the International Monetary Fund. And he will be sharing with you his own perspective on the, the biggest question that uh, has absorbed so many global uh, uh, watchers. What is going on in China? How is the economy faring? What are the effects both uh, short-term and long-term of the radical reforms that are being put into place? As Secretary of the IMF, um, Secretary Ling oversees the Secretary's Department that has operational responsibility for the 24-member executive board and he serves as the official contact point for the IMF's 
188 members, country members, on institutional matters, and that includes the work of the Board of Governors um, and many other uh, parts. Secretary Ling is a Chinese native, um, but uh, he has spent good time in the US. He was appointed to his current position March 2012. Um, he previously served in senior positions in the Secretary's Finance Policy Department and Review and Asia and Pacific Departments. Secretary Ling um, did spend some time as a student in the United States. Uh, he was at the, uh, at the University of California, Berkeley, and received his doctorate at George Washington. So in many ways, both um, Secretary Ling and Professor Stiglitz represent so much of the common ground that all of us have uh, sought to establish between US and China. Secretary Ling. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Lulu, for your warm words. And also, thank you all uh, for coming to the lunch. I'm delighted to be here, uh, owing to thanks to uh, Dominic and C100. And it's really my great pleasure to be with so many of you uh, today. So normally we say, you know, we often uh, would have a great difficulty or very intimidating to speak out a great speaker like Professor Stiglitz. However, I find his speech always, always very inspiring and uh, very insightful. So with that aspiration, let me offer my remarks. So I would like to take this opportunity to share with you a few broad global issues, as well as some issues in emerging market economies, including China. So first, global economy. Earlier this month, the IMF and the World Bank had its annual, we call spring meeting gathering uh, of all the membership, 188 countries. About 7,000 people came, officials, academic, uh, private sector, and media, to discuss global economic prospects, risks, and policy responses. So from these meetings, there was a sense, clearly, that global economy is slowly turning the corner. So global, global prospects are improving. Our projection shows global economic growth will be around 3.6% this year and could rise to 4% next year. Then the question is, how this, does this mean that you know, we are out of the crisis, which you know, uh, uh, has been with us for the past five years? Yes, in some aspects and no in others, in my view. In my view, we are heading toward the right direction, but we still have a long way to go to build a global economy that is strong, balanced, inclusive, and sustainable. So good news aside, we continue to face some old problems as well as some new risks. So let me briefly mention, first, Global growth, as I said, is still slow and uneven. Emerging market developing countries continue to lead global growth, which have contributed in a very big way during the financial crisis, and will continue to do so this year and the next. I will touch upon more detail later on. It is expected that this group will grow by 5% this year and could reach 5.5% next year. Economic activity, as you all know, in the US continues to improve. Growth is expected to be close to 3% this year and the next. In the euro area, after you know, negative growth in the past two years, a modest recovery now is taking hold. So growth is expected to be over 1% positive this year and could reach one and a half percent next year. So therefore, overall, global prospects, as I said, slowly strengthen. However, problems still continue. Unemployment remains very high in many countries, particularly in Europe. Today, more than 200 million people are still out of job. 75 million are young people and some fresh uh, college graduates. Spain and Greece 
unemployment remains close to 30%, very high. Second, large government debt burdens also remain a problem in many advanced economies. In many countries, the government debt to GDP ratio is at a record high level since World War II. Third, financial sector reform is still incomplete. As we all recall, it is a problem in this particular sector that triggered the 2008 financial crisis in the first place. Now, these old problems aside, we also see some new risks emerging. I will name three. First, in advanced economies, particularly in the Eurozone, the risk of prolonged low inflation, or sometimes you refer to deflation, is looming and need to be addressed quickly and seriously. Otherwise, it could hurt economic recovery. Second new risk is uh, uh, in emerging market economies, the risk of a heightened market volatility, particularly associated with capital outflows and a large exchange rate depreciations, partly as a result of the U.S. monetary policy tapering. Third risk, geopolitical tensions, particularly in Ukraine, could also cloud the global outlook. Resolving such tensions, of course, require good policies, but more importantly, good politics. So that is the global outlook. Now, let me now turn to emerging market uh, and developing economies. Now, this is a very large group of countries, including China, India, and many other Asian economies, but as well as also many more on other continents. As a group, these countries have emerged as a very powerful and stabilizing force in the global economy during the financial crisis. So let's look at a few numbers. In 2000, these countries as a group accounted for only one-fifth of the global economy, 20%. 10 years later, in 2010, this share rose to one-third. Further, three years later, in 2013, the share rose further to close to 40%. Now, this is based on the so-called market exchange rates. If based on the concept uh, Professor uh, Stiglitz referred to purchasing power parity, the share will be greater. Similarly, in the 1990s, about one-third of the total global economic growth came from this group of countries, one-third. By 2007, half. By two, then, from 2007 to 2013, past five years, three-fourths of the global economy, economic growth came from emerging markets. China alone contributed to about one-third to global growth altogether. In terms of trade, the share of emerging market economies was very small, 16% in 1990. Today, 40% and still rising. So this good and rosy picture aside, emerging market economies also face challenges, in my view, short term and also long term. In the short run, they will continue to face large and volatile capital flows. And a large capital inflows to these countries could help growth, fuel economic activity, but could also lead to rapid credit expansion and booming housing sector, which we have seen in recent years in some countries. Since last May, all of a sudden there were sudden and a large rapid reversals of capital flows. Part of the reason why, because the former U.S. Fed Chairman Bernanke hinted last May at the U.S. monetary policy taper, so money flew out of the emerging markets. Now, this created large exchange rate movements, big uncertainties, and thus some lower economic activity in many emerging markets. So some of you may wonder then, will emerging market economies experience financial crisis such as the one in Asia in late 1990s? 
So in my view, this is not likely, at least for now. Three reasons. First, most emerging market countries today have stronger and more flexible policy framework and institutions, including what we call exchange rate regimes, more flexible. Second, most countries have lower external debt burdens than before. Third, most countries have much higher international reserves, thus stronger buffers against any potential risks. So as a result, these countries have been able to respond to volatile capital movements recently more quickly and forcefully than before. Now let me mention a few longer term challenges facing these countries. Here I see two or three, probably three. The first one is relatively weak financial sector in these countries. Now this is particularly so if we compare the financial sector in these countries to their real sector and the trade sector. For example, emerging market economies account for only 25% of the global equity market, 15% of the global bond market, but their economic size and trade size account for roughly 40%. So here's the difference. Therefore, there is a big room for these countries to develop the financial sector in support of a sustained economic growth in a long time to come. Second challenge is increasing pressure on public spending. Looking back, when the advanced economies were in the developing stage, public spending surged from 20% of GDP in 1960s to 30% of GDP in 70s and to 40% of GDP in late 1980s and early 1990s. So big number, 20, 30, 40. Why high spending? Because of the, you know, the, the population aging, pension requirements, healthcare requirements, other social services, also desire for better, more education, and infrastructure needs. So the question then is, will emerging market economies follow a similar path of increasing public spending pressure in the years ahead? If so, how should they be prepared for it? So that's a question mark there. Third long-term challenge, in my view, facing these countries, is how to ensure that economic growth will be more inclusive and friendlier to the environment and also sustainable. So here I will touch upon a little bit more detail uh, when we discuss China. So now China. On China, I share so many points uh, discussed by Professor Stiglitz, I know, totally and 100% uh, you know, sharing these, these views. So I thought the point was so good, I'd like to repeat a few, if you don't mind. <laughs> <laughs> so as we all know, right, China has written a remarkable history, in my view, in economic history, over the past 30 years. A few numbers will demonstrate. Since 1980, China has grown at the rate of close to 10% a year. 500 million people have been lifted out of poverty. 350 million jobs have been offered. China's share in global economy has increased multifold to 12% last year based on the market exchange rate calculation, and now second largest. China's exports surpassed US last year to the world largest. In technology, which I have been most impressed, China is now home to the world's largest network of high-speed railways, 15,000 kilometers, half of the world total. In just six years, China has gone from importing this technology to exporting it now, which is truly amazing. So when I started in Beijing in the mid-1970s, long time ago, it took me normally four or five days, one way from my hometown in Zhejiang province to Beijing. Today, two and a half hours by air, 10 hours by high-speed train. So last year, you know, I took my family to China. We particularly tried to take the speed train from uh, Wenzhou, my hometown, to Hangzhou, then to Shanghai. It's so impressive. So my kids said, next time, we'll do it again. So I will also encourage you, when you go to China, try speed, uh, uh, you know, the speed train. 
It's just very impressive. So in addition, China is playing a very you know, increasingly active, important role in major international fora, such as G20, IMF, uh, World Bank, APEC, and others. Now, these are good things. So good things aside, China is also facing some challenges. While headline GDP numbers are still impressive, 7.4, 7.5%, serious problems remain and need to be overcome, like Professor Stiglitz uh, uh, mentioned. So in my view, the overall challenge is clear. How to make growth more inclusive, friendlier to the environment, and more sustainable, as I mentioned before. Here, I would like to emphasize four elements that might help China meet this challenge. First, unleashing the potential of the services sector, as Professor Stiglitz exactly referred to. Second, building a modern financial sector. So both have a great potential to, to grow further. Third, strengthening inclusive and safeguarding the environment. And finally, increasing the quality of growth. So let me just be very brief on the four points. First, services sector. China indeed is now a, how, the manufacturing powerhouse in the world economy. The next round of reforms, which are now being undertaken, must or should be aimed at increasing the role of the services sector. Today, China's service sector is relatively underdeveloped, only account for 40% of its GDP, as compared to the world average, 65%. US, 80%. BRICS, 65%. Even among the uh, uh, BRICS, India pretty low, 55%. So meaning, if China you know, develops its service sector, potential is huge. So that might also provide some business, business opportunities for, for, for you people sitting here. Second, more than financial sector. Financial sector in emerging market generally speaking, is weak. As I said, mentioned earlier, China is the same. Now, even though China has some largest commercial banks in the world, now recently China has taken commendable steps, including you know, uh, modernizing, uh, including uh, the widening of the exchange rate band uh, and the commitment to completing the process of interest rate liberalization in two years' time. Yet, in my view, there is still some way to go to establish the financial system with strong and transparent regulations and supervision. Indeed, we have recently heard a lot about the rapid expansion of the total social financing, which has risen from 130% GDP in 2008 to about 200% of GDP today and also the rise of non-bank financial intermediation we often refer to as shadow banking. Third, strengthening inclusion and safeguarding environment here. You know, I don't want to go uh, deep into it. I share totally what Professor Stiglitz has said. You know, the income equality is a rising problem issue in China. They need to be addressed. On the environment, the governor said so well, here we need good regulation, we need investment and we need technology. And oh, clearly, we need also patience. It will take, some, take a long time to do so. So final point of the four is striking the right balance between speed and the quality of growth. Here, so much has been discussed already. So I will only cite a very few numbers. Research shows that during 2001 and eight, productivity gains in China, efficiency gains in China, contributed to over one-third of GDP growth in China. So 10%, about one-third came from productivity gain. In more recent years, this share declined to about one-fourth. So looking ahead for China to sustain its growth at a medium to high level, which is official target, it, in my view, must rely more on innovation, knowledge sharing, and the productivity gains rather than solely on investment. So facing all these many challenges, the question now is how China can safeguard and nurture further success. Here again, in my view, success will depend on how China is able to transform and improve its growth 
by relying more on the role of the market forces, transparent and accountable rules and regulations, and better education and innovation we refer to so often. To me, these are the key. It is innovation that can keep China at the leading edge of economic progress. So I was in China a month ago, together with Professor Stiglitz, attending the China uh, Development Forum, and had the opportunity to meet with a lot of people, including in the government. I was very or most impressed by the openings of those I met uh, regarding the problems, challenges China faces. Five years ago, 10 years ago, they were all hiding the problems. You know, they're very shy, but today they're very open. So that itself shows the level of confidence, but also their determination and commitment to overcome these difficulties. Among all the reform measures, altogether there are more than 300 items. Fiscal budgetary reform account for about 200 items of the 300 items, that's massive. But people are very determined. They all recognize that addressing these problems will be a long undertaking. But also no, efforts must be made before problems become worse. So indeed, the breadth and the depth of these reforms uh, will require a continued, very firm commitments and the spirit, the spirit of bold exploration. Not easy, but if done well, they will indeed support China's next transformation. So now let me conclude. So I have talked quite a bit about global picture and issues in emerging markets and China, but I have not yet discussed anything about opportunities, which is part of my title of the remarks. As we know in China, we often say, challenges and opportunities go hand in hand. And in today's world, which is so connected, interconnected, our prosperity is linked together. And it depends more than ever before, our working together. Like the theme of C100, we must seek common ground. So therefore, global challenges require global solutions. Now, as regards to China, I hope I'm able to use these very few words to describe its path ahead. That is, the future is bright, but the road is arduous. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for an a, a excellent keynote address from Secretary Lin Jinghai. And this concludes the formal part of our speaking program. The, um, the discussion will resume, the session will resume in about 15 minutes, 1.35 to be exact. Please be prompt, 1.35 will meet you back next door. Thank you. Okay.